Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here today with State Representative Michael Gruitza, who represents the 7th Legislative District from Mercer County. He has been here since 1981, and he is completing his term here in 2006. Thank you for being here with me today. It's my pleasure to be here. I wanted to begin by asking you about your childhood and your family life and how that prepared you to be a public servant. Well, I, I grew up in a pretty typical uh, Sharon, Pennsylvania family, and in some respects typical, in other ways a little, little different. Um, ours is an industrial area, so a lot of the kids' parents worked in the mills, and I grew up in a family business. My father uh, owned and operated uh, a building supply company. Uh, we had cement mixers and dump trucks and um, a lot of hard work, you know, a lot of heavy equipment. And I spent a lot of time uh, at what we called the yard, uh, working with him and my brothers that also worked there uh, uh, as, as boys growing up, even at a pretty young age. Um, there was always some kind of little chore even for a six or seven year old to, to be doing down there if it was cleaning tools or, or whatever and, and uh, so it was a big part of my childhood and I think the nature of the business um, made our family very well known in the community. Um, my father was very popular, a very popular person. My mother was very active. They were both very active in our church and um, I guess the nature of the business gave my father the opportunity to do a lot of favors for people. And as I grew up, uh, I felt that I wanted to do something other than that. Although, as I've reflected on it, you know, in, in my later years, I could see how much fun we really had as a family and with all the workers that we had and the many good people that worked for the family. Uh, it, it was... Uh, a very unique experience. Uh, but after graduating from college and then in law school and returning home, I uh, returned to a district that, that, that kind of distressed me in a way. Uh, one of the things, I had attended law school out in uh, Western Ohio at Ohio Northern University. And there wasn't very much really to do there other than study and get together occasionally with your friends and, and that that we'd take rides in the country and sometimes visit county courthouses and you know just kind of taking in the natural the, the kind of picturesque beauty of that part of the state and when I got home the roads in our area were so bad that it really bothered me I thought you know if at very least the state government ought to be able to uh, provide a, a system of state highways that aren't in the shambles that our roads were, and that was pretty much true of, of the entire state, but particularly the case in western and southwestern and northwestern Pennsylvania. And um, it was really one of the issues that helped that, I guess sometimes being upset about something gets you more involved in, in what's going on. And, um, and growing up in the construction business, it was kind of a natural thing that uh, I paid attention to and it was something that I, I guess as we go on in this interview I can touch on but it was really a high priority for me when I was elected I mean our phones uh, rang off the wall in those first uh, uh, few years and uh, I got on the transportation committee and um, I, I, I think that every time the Department of Transportation came to the legislature looking for help to get the, the money they needed to fix the roads. I, I, don't, I think every single time I supported their efforts uh, and would continue to do so if, if I was continuing in this office. Could you talk a little bit about um, your first campaign run? I'm guessing the roads were probably a motivating factor. And well, it was one, one of the things. Um, what had happened in, in my case, uh, I was motivated as well by some incidents that happened to me as a young lawyer at the courthouse and I so I made the decision to run for district attorney and uh, the truth of the matter is the district attorney that we had was an excellent uh, attorney uh, and an excellent prosecutor uh, one of the best I've ever seen and I've seen a lot of trials and I've, I've observed a lot of uh, things in the courthouse and in the courtrooms and I've, I've seen some great, worked with so many great lawyers here. He, he was a great attorney. I, um, 
but I had some issues. And I ran and, and lost in a fairly close primary. And that kind of got my name out there. And, and so when, when my predecessor, Reed Bennett, made the decision to retire from the House, a lot of people came to me and, and asked me if I would be interested in running. And it wasn't really um, an instant yes, you know. I, I really had to give it some thought because it was quite a departure from where I was and what I was doing. And, and I enjoyed the practice of law and, and the work I was doing. But I, I was uh, very strongly encouraged uh, by our, our labor organizations. We had a lot of steel workers and the, and the trades, all of them were really encouraging me to run. And I spoke to my father ab about it, and he felt, you know, why not? Why not? You know, it, it's uh, a two-year term. Uh, if you don't like it, if, if it doesn't feel like something you want to do, you don't have to run again. And so I did run and, and won uh, uh, in, in that first campaign. It was a tough race. We've had many since then, but um, I was fortunate enough to win that one and come down here to Harrisburg to serve the 7th District. Do you like to campaign? Um, there's things about a campaign I, I, I like, um, but to be honest with you, not particularly. Um, especially, we had some pretty tough elections and, and uh, you, you know, you, you just, it, it's kind of like running a gauntlet a little bit. Um, I think I, what's gratifying in a campaign is that last day, on the election day, when you're out going around the polls and people are coming up to you saying, hey, you're our, you're our choice, you're, you're our man, we think you're doing a good job. Because once you're an incumbent, that's really what you're doing. You're, you're running in many respects against your, your own record. And, um, and by and large, that's how we ran our campaigns. We focused on the things we were able to accomplish for the district our priorities legislatively and our concerns for the people in the district and there were we had all, through the years a lot of very serious issues in that district with uh, people losing their jobs in, in our some of our mills and uh, all of the difficulties that are associated with with those types of very difficult problems what else can you tell me about the seventh legislative district well, I think the 7th District is one of um, Pennsylvania's really best-kept secrets. Uh, a lot of people, you know, have the image of, oh, it's a, you know, rusty steel town, you know, Sharon and Hermitage and Farrell and Sharpsville and uh, the, the, the uh, townships that surround the area. It's a very diverse area. It, it really has a very s urban center uh, and suburban and rural with farms and woodlands and uh, it's a beautiful district really. It, by and large the community um, is made up of, of very nice neighborhoods, a, a very a very ni good housing stock. We have um, a pretty good I think public school system. The schools are beautiful. Uh, they've invested heavily in, in the physical plants uh, at, in all of the districts. We also have some very good private schools in the district, and some of the, the Catholic schools uh, in, in the district. Uh, in the center of the district is located a, a gift that was given to the community by Frank Buell, who was a, a very prominent philanthropist from Sharon. And he had a park built. It's a 300-acre park that virtually sits in the center of, of all the communities I, I've just described. It borders on Sharon, it borders on Hermitage, it borders on Sharpsville. And it's, uh, for a smaller sized uh, community, it's really kind of like the crown gem of the community. It's like something you'd see in a big, big city setting. And attached to that is, I, I believe, the only free public golf course in the country. It's a, a nine hole uh, course, which, uh, is, is very much utilized and it, it, it gives the kids in, in Sharon the opportunity to learn to golf. So we have a lot of avid golfers as well as hunters and fishermen and every, you know, that, that you have everywhere else. But I think um, that was something that, that, that helped to push the, the um, golf button in, in our area. And so, atta so, so all through there, there are also several you know, there's a private country club and, and several other very nice golf courses. 
We get a lot of visitors from Cleveland and Pittsburgh, especially in the summer months. that will come up and stay at our hotels and take the weekend or a few days off and enjoy the community. Did reapportionment ever affect your district? Uh, it, it did a little bit. My, my district uh, had a tendency to lose population in its center and Sharon and Farrell and I think a little bit in Sharpsville um, and, and move eastward, and move, move outward. And so I picked up a few townships. Uh, at one point I picked up a Del Delaware township and then the next reapportionment I lost Delaware township and got another uh, area. And um, then in this last reapportionment I got Delaware township back again. And, it felt good to me to, when I'd go out there and, and, and meet with the local township supervisors. They, they were always very complimentary. They were always glad when I was their representative because I, I have always said that even the smaller communities that I represented, I tried to treat fairly and didn't, you know, favor one town over another. If people had a good proposal or a good project, we would try to help shepherd that through the process here in Harrisburg and do what we could to to bring home some state dollars to help them. In which ways did you bring home state dollars? Well, in, in, a, in a variety of ways. Um, from the early days here, uh, there's really a big difference in, in the programs that are, are now funded and have been you know, put into place by the state from what existed uh, in the early days. A lot of, in, prior to my election, communities really relied more heavily on the federal government to fund community development or uh, needs and, and projects in their in the area and th that well, that went away and so the states t have taken a more active role through you know over any all the different programs through the department of community and economic development um, originally called the department of community affairs i, I believe um, the department of commerce programs the, the di various loan programs uh, we had many, many businesses take advantage of the PETA program and those t those types of things to uh, expand or make improvements at their businesses. And it was a it's a good program because it ties those dollars to either job retention or job growth. And um, one of the one of the more unusual things that happened in Governor Thornburg's uh, term. He proposed in his budget what he called the Steel Valley Renaissance Initiative, and he was targeting pretty significant dollars. I believe he, he had picked the Beaver Valley and the Mon Valley and the Allegheny Valley for, for special targeting, and I got involved in that, and we got the Shenango Valley in, included in that funding, and that went on for several years. Uh, well into the Casey administration targeting in most of the budgets like a million dollars a year for special needs and the 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 great thing about that was it it was flexible dollars that could be used you know for a number of different different things in fact uh, a good deal of that money is still in the area uh, the agency that was chosen to administer those funds um, decided that uh, a good, one of the good things to do would be to establish a low interest loan fund to kind of help projects along and things like that. And I believe right now they have three or four million dollars uh, still in that trust fund that's available for use for uh, uh, projects in, in the district. That's great. County. So that, that was a pretty significant accomplishment for me. I was wondering if you could take a step back in time and tell me how you felt during your first swearing-in ceremony. Well, I think I felt pretty much the same way as I felt in everyone. Um, and, you know, it's, it's of course it's a very gala event here, and flowers are all over the floor, and uh, thousands of people are jammed in the Capitol, and it's a it's a celebration really of it because you know members go through um, in many cases some pretty tough campaigns to have that privilege of taken that oath of office and um, so I, I felt proud to be here and look looking forward to taking on the, the challenges of the next term and uh, it was some, something that not not everybody has that opportunity in a state of 12 million people you know there are only 203 house members and 50 senators so it's it's kind of special
Was there anything that surprised you when you first came to Harrisburg? Um, you know, I can't really say that there was anything that really took me took me back uh, particularly. It was pretty much what I expected. You know, I I uh, uh, no, I can't really think of anything that okay. took me by surprise. Do you recall your first office in the Capitol building? Yeah. Yeah, I was in, in this same building. Uh, I shared uh, office space with um, John Wozniak, and we, the two of us uh, shared the same secretary, the same assistant. And um, that lasted for the period of about, I want to say six, eight months, some, something like that. And then John, we were given the opportunity then to, to have our own individual uh, assistant. And the the young woman that, that originally came to both of us, John said, "Why don't you keep Diane because you have you have more work than I do, and she's so good, and I'll take the I'll take the next one." And that and and Diane's retiring now as well after being with me for 25 years, and she she did an outstanding job for me and for the people that we represent. Well, I'd like to talk about. Um Mr. Wozniak for a second. Great. Um, what kind of activities do you think produce camaraderie? Because uh, I know that you and Hay were involved in a uh, walk for work, and yes, I would like for you to talk about that. To together. Um, well, for one, we, uh, it, it really happened by accident because we were thrown, thrown together in the same office, and um, we represented similar types of districts. John uh, represents the Johnstown area, and uh, and then went on to be, of course, be elected to the state senate there. And, uh, you know, in his case, I've always enjoyed his great sense of humor and, and uh, his honesty. Uh, what happened with the walk was uh, I was watching TV one night, and the uh, news came on and said that the two areas in the entire country with the highest unemployment were the Ch Sharon metropolitan area and in Johnstown metropolitan area. So um, I called John and said, you know, this is unbelievable, really. It's just, isn't that, and it's so ironic that we worked together literally in the same office. We weren't even separated at the time by walls. We, you know, I'd hear, hear all of his conversations on the phone and he would hear all of mine. And I said, I think we need to do something about this. And he said, what do you have in mind? I said, why don't we walk to Washington? We'll, we'll go in a few weeks or, you know, I forget exactly the timing, but I said we'd shoot for like early April, I think it was. I said, the weather should be decent and we can make a, a, try to make a point of the fact that not everybody's re enjoying a comeback in this economy. And um, so we did it and we set out from the Capitol here and in five days we walked down, we got to meet with Tip O'Neill and Jim Wright in the speaker's office, which is very unusual. They actually let the media with the TV cameras and, and everything into the speaker's office. And one of the reporters there said it's very, very unusual that they let the cameras into his inner office in the Capitol. I, I doubt that that would happen today because of all the security concerns and in and, and that. We might not even get into the Capitol today. but. Uh, <laughs> But it was really quite an experience, and we just basically we met. We found a lot of support along the way. From when we were in the rural areas, and farmers would go by because we had a van nearby that people could see that we were the guys doing this, and we'd gotten a lot of media attention, all the local newspapers, and really all over the country. We were we made the front page of the Chicago Sun Times. You know, it was kind of a big deal, and. Um, it sort of took on a life of its own. But farmers and locals would beep their horns and say, go ahead, you guys, you know, that was good. And I remember walking through Baltimore, and uh, so, some of the locals in, in, were, you know, through the streets of Baltimore, and some of the locals there stopped and saying, hey, man, are you those guys walking to Washington? And we'd say, yeah. You go tell them, man, you know, it's just a different... All, all segments of society 
In other words, that, that we passed, we were given the keys to the city, uh, a proclamation by, I believe it was Mayor Hunter at the time. He was the mayor of Baltimore, and they had a big uh, thing there at the, at the city building in, in, in Baltimore. And uh, it, it was a, quite an experience, really. So did it raise awareness, though? I, I, I think it, it really did. And the thing that struck me was that and I, the, a lot of decisions aren't just made by legislators and governors. And what I felt it did, at least for my area, was a lot of the people that work within state government who make big decisions on, on where dollars are going to get directed through various programs uh, and, and where, where money is going to go. I felt that uh, in some of our departments, what we did helped to uh, let people here know where Sharon and Farrell and Johnstown were and that these were districts that were struggling, that, that had a lot of people put out of work and that needed help. That's a wonderful story, and I appreciate you it, sharing. It, it was, uh, it was a, quite an experience, really. <laughs> we had one funny, funny experience, um, if you want to hear it. We had several, but one, we were walking up through the hills I, I, in very rural Maryland. I didn't realize at the time how hilly that country is, and what we found was going down the hills was harder than going up them. It was hard on your knees. But we stopped at this rural tavern and restaurant to get a sandwich. And there was an old guy, he must have been in his late 70s, working on a shot and a beer. And the other people were interested in what we were all about. And we, we basically got ordered some food there and had a sandwich. And, and uh, t we're talking about what we were doing. And this old man was sitting there the whole time, you know, not saying anything across the bar there. And um, finally, was, we were get, got up to leave, and he looked up and looked at us, and he says, Hey, boys, I hope you get that job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he knew it had something to do with work, but wasn't exactly uh, focused on what it, what it was. But it was, it was really pretty funny at the time. Um. Can you talk about any other camaraderie in the house or any other special close oh, relationships? I've made, I've made great friends here with um, you know, a lot of current members, but, but a lot of their predecessors. Uh, you know, a lot of really good people have come through here. And um, you know, just so many th different things. You know, we used to, I used to play a lot of basketball with the guys on certain two, Monday or Tuesday nights. We'd go out to the gym. and. We played softball, and we, we had, actually for a while, we had a house football team that I, I was a member. And uh, we'd play Ohio State. They were the ones that kind of initiated it because when Penn State first got into the Big Ten and that, they said, well, we have a football team, a legislative football team, and we want to challenge you. And those things were a lot of fun, going to Columbus uh, and, and playing them up there and meeting the legislators from there and representing our state. And, um, but so many things, so many functions, and and um, just just even the work around the Capitol. There are a lot of very entertaining members here, and, and uh, in fact, sometimes people would say, "Well, hey, have you, have you heard any good jokes lately?" Because you, you get them from all over the state in this building, you know. Yeah. Um, whenever you first came to Harrisburg, did anybody mentor you? Well. I think in a way, a little bit of, you know, a lot of different people. I, I was close to um, uh, some of the legislators from my own area, you know, Tom Fee from the Lawrence County area. And we, we would, he would tell me, you know, just w w share his thoughts on different things and how to approach different things and on some issues that he felt were the district would be more sensitive to than than they might be in other areas, and uh, and uh, Roy Wilt, uh, who was a representative, and then almost immediately went over to the Senate. He was in the House for a few years with me, as I as I recall it, and um, I always looked up to him. Uh, he was kind of a uh, statesman of a of a rep, you know, very articulate, very level-headed, and um, I, I would say those two. 
you know. But but at the same time, you know, if you went to Jim Mandarino or and, or, and sat down with him or or, or Kay Lee Roy Irvis, um, they would. So I remember one year we were doing a budget, and this was a Casey budget, and there were I don't know how many hundreds of amendments being proposed, and everybody knew that that wasn't going to happen. And I was in the back of the house talking to some of the Republicans. We were in the majority at the time. Mr. Irvis was the speaker, and I said, you know, I'll, I'll move the previous question, which is a very pretty dramatic thing. It doesn't happen here very often, particularly in a budget. And I made the motion, some of the Republican members said, if you do, we'll give you the votes to, to pass this budget. And Mr. Irvis called me up to the rostrum up in the front, and he said, son, uh, I don't want to see you get embarrassed here on, on this vote, because this is a big vote. And, and I said, I think I have the votes, Mr. Irvis. He says, are you sure you have the votes, son? <laughs> I said, I think so. And we did. And 10 minutes later, we passed that budget. So that was something. <laughs> so how, how did you feel going up to, to talk to Mr. Well, I, like that? he made me, gave me pause to think, you know, um, you know are these guys going to back down on me? But they, they said, no, we're, we're with you on this. We don't, we don't need to go through all this to okay. pass this budget. And it was a good budget. What was your relationship like with um, leadership and other? Very good. It's always been good with leadership on both sides of the aisle. Um, and, and with the, the Senate as well. I've, I've had good relationships with the members over there. <laughs> they've, helped, they've helped me with a number of things. Can you tell me, have you had the opportunity to mentor anybody while you were here? Well, I've tried to, you know, be a good friend if somebody, you know, ha came to me for advice. And, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself a mentor mm. per, per se, but... Um, you know, if anybody's ever asked, I always tell the members that are newly elected, uh, especially from our area, that one of the most important things is to just be very careful on the road. People lose sight of the fact that most of the members coming from western Pennsylvania, you know, are driving uh, four hours plus to get to the capital, oftentimes in very trying conditions, snowing or sleeting or raining hard or you know we, we get bad weather in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and a lot of truck traffic because there's really only two major routes you can take to get here and um, I, I, that's usually the first piece of advice I give new members that the most important thing to do is be careful and be attentive on the road. That's good advice coming from how is it four hours? Four, it's a four-hour drive if, if the capital of Ohio was the capital of Pennsylvania I'd have an hour less to, to drive uh, one way, two hours less round trip. Hmm. From my district, I can be in Detroit the same amount of time as I can be here. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> Pennsylvania is a bigger state than you think of it. Yeah. What committees were you involved in, and did you enjoy your roles in those committees? I was, I've served on almost all of the committees, and, and I did. I enjoyed my time on, on appropriations. I, I w was fortunate. I, I believe I was on that committee the very first term and transportation I enjoyed because as I mentioned before, transportation was an issue uh, for me and, and trying to get things turned around in our area. Um, consumer affairs, um, game and fisheries, um, professional licensure. I, I served as the Democratic chairman for, on the game and fish, com, fisheries committee for a number of years as Democratic chairman of the state government committee for a number of years, and finally is the Democratic Chairman of the Children and Youth Committee, which was also a, a learning experience with the, uh, the very, all the different programs and the very, all the different issues that involve, you know, our, our young people, which is really our, our future. So can you tell me a little bit about the legislation and your issues? Well, I've had a lot of, lot of different issues. A lot of my biggest issues have, have been, though, to try to promote um, economic recovery and jobs. And that's, that's really been, I've always felt that the best, uh, if you want to call it welfare reform or crime reform, is to provide young people with decent jobs that they can support themselves, that, that, that they're not, you know, what's the old expression, an idle mind is a devil's workshop kind of thing. And it, it actually bothers me um, because I have a whole generation of young people 
who have grown up, and I've been their representative. So when I read in the paper uh, some promising youngster that maybe had, had been a football or basketball star or, or whatever they were involved in, and any of them are, have gotten themselves in a lot of trouble, uh, it, it bothers me because, you know, you, I believe there are opportunities, and, you know, it's not a perfect world, but um, you know, one of the things that, that I learned as the chair on the Children and Youth Committee was that the, the more you can do with youngsters, especially those that are, that are, ha that are struggling at a young age and in school and, or have behavioral problems or whatever, the, the, the more you can do, uh, in the long run, it's a, it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was first elected, I think we had somewhere around 10,000 inmates it may, may have been less than that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the numbers, but I think I don't know, today we have 50,000. We, we have almost, you know, like almost a legislative district. And um, that's a very, that's been a, uh, <laughs> all these things dovetail together, but that's something our appropriations people have had to re wrestle with each and every budget is this expanding corrections budget that, that we faced. And, um, it's just something that has to be reversed. It, it's got to be reversed. And um, I think that creating employment opportunities is the top way of doing that. <clears throat> so how are the roads now in Mercer County? The roads are, are the best they've been since I was a child. It may be better. Um, they've really, uh, in fact, this summer was something. I, I don't know if it was a going away present for me or, or, or what, but uh, people were complaining because of the delays, because of the, all the paving that was going on. And, uh, and I've always paid attention to that. And the roads are really, the state system is really in pretty good shape. And we, we've made a lot, had a number of other, other than the maintenance and the, that type of thing, we've, 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 got, we've gotten some very nice projects mm -hmm. uh, approved. Uh, some smaller, you know, some, some maybe just a few hundred thousand, maybe a couple million dollars, some bridges that the community has sought for, for years. Um, probably the highlight for me was as part of my, what I called Shenango Valley Renaissance, going way back to Governor Thornburg, I had proposed a number of different projects and different types of initiatives to, to try to move the district in a positive direction. And one of them was to make a significant major improvement to one of the main state highways that runs through the district, if not, if not the main road, the, the second. We have Route 62 that runs through the valley and Route 18, two very important arteries. And um, Route 18 was in dire need of upgrading. And ultimately, we got, got it done in two phases. The first phase was um, under Governor Casey because it was a very expensive project. It was about a $50 million deal. And the second phase was under Governor Ridge. And so now we have a beautiful five-lane corridor that runs through the city of Hermitage in the heart of the district. And a lot of new development is occurring along that, that highway now, which is, of course brings in jobs and brings in uh, revenues to the mu local municipality and school district and, and the property taxes that that these million dollars and multi-million dollar projects have, have generated. Well, most of your issues seem like they're very similar. Economic growth, economic uh, enhancements. That's been, that's been important, and, you know, and in line with that, I, I, I've been probably someone you would describe as a more district-oriented individual, working pretty closely with my local governments and, and, and the folks back home uh, trying to get as much help from this state back to, to that faraway district. Uh, and, and we've been, I'm satisfied with the job we've done. In fact, Governor Rendell, with, with just in his time, he was in the county a few months back and was talking about all, just on, just on his watch, and I forget the exact number, I'm, I'm, uh, it was like $34 million in, in various things in Mercer County that that have come through just, you know, in the last year or two. So 
That's I think great. we've I think we've made a, our mark. What would you say? What aspect of your job do you think you enjoyed the most? I think the aspect that I enjoyed the most was uh, just what I'm talking about when when we, we are, when you get something accomplished that you can lay your hands on and see. Um, we we had a project running in the in the heart of the city of Sharon. Uh, again, it was another highway project, and the city had always been interested in getting turning lanes and just vamping that up because you drive and you get stopped by somebody turning off on one of the side streets and this and that, and uh, frequent accidents because, you know, of all the stopping and going. And, and that stretch of road is, uh, on each side of that road are, are really two nice neighborhoods, large, kind of the heart of Sharon. And... So when that little project was a couple million dollar project, but I felt good when that was finished, and and, the, and I, you could actually say, you know, all the people living on either side of that highway, their whole neighborhood has been enhanced. Mm -hmm. It looked better, safer to drive through. It was nice, you know, and I got a lot of satisfaction out of those things, and I right down to just helping out some individual that you know has had a problem with the state or something a grievance that, that you can intervene on their behalf and get it straightened out, those, those types of things. What did you not like about your job? The driving. Um, no. that, that was, I have to say, there, there were some days when in the fall when the sun was shining and, you know, uh, we're you know, driving through Pennsylvania is, is, is beautiful. And that's probably more true for somebody that's on vacation and they've never driven through Pennsylvania and they're taking in all the, all the colors and all that. But when every week you, you get in the car and drive through the blizzards and the fog and, you know, uh, everything that goes with it, that was a real, that's, that takes a lot out of you. What were the major changes that you've seen in the house since you've been here? Well, I think the, the whole capital um, the, the House and the Senate leadership have, have taken a, uh, d deserve a lot of credit for, for what they've done here in terms of upgrading. The Capitol was starting to look a little run down when I first got here, and um, the leadership said, we, we can't allow this to happen, and a lot of restoration has taken place in a lot of the buildings, the, the, what's now the Matt Ryan building, it was a, just a classic old building, and there was even talk of them maybe tearing it down. It was it was so bad, and they've restored it so beautifully. It's it's a you know it's a gem, and the Capitol itself and the addition of the East Wing, you know we we got criticized for the East Wing when it was being proposed and this and that, but the truth is that that's as much of the people's building as it is the people who work here, and I was talking to a girl that runs one of the coffee shops over there. And she said, oh, Mike, when people come in, she said, they love this. They're very proud of this building. And I said, well, they should be. Because you know, you know, every week we have thousands of people in here, just about every week, when, especially when the members are here. And she said, everybody, people from Pennsylvania lo love this capital. Um, we've been given, um, I think, better staff and more staff to, to help us do the job. Um, of course, you know, the... the Members, when I came, were jammed up on the fifth floor in the Capitol building, and everybody really has now a, their own nice office and, and at least one staff person when they start. So all these little things that, you know, I think have added up to, to making the job a little easier and um, help and more and enabling members to be a little more effective for their areas. Has technology impacted you well, at all? Well, technology as well, you know. They, I'm still learning on the computer, but um, sure, you know, we... We all have computers on our desks now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the most memorable event that occurred during your tenure was? Well, there's good events and there's bad events. I, I suppose for these purposes, um, um, the photographer was here earlier and she mentioned about going to Philadelphia for the big anniversary celebration of the state. Uh, was that the sesquicentennial? I think. And um, that was a big event. That was, that was pretty, everybody was there. The House actually went in a session there. I think it was in a tent, I'm not sure. 
but it, that, that was pretty, there have been a, a number of things. There have been sad things, we've, you know, members passing that, you know, seem perfectly healthy if maybe a few weeks before and then you get word that uh, something's happened. The most tragic thing, I think, was the Bud Dwyer situation. That was shocking and sad and un should have never happened. Um, but there, you know, there have been just so many different, like, social type events and those things um, that have been enjoyable. Do you have any fondest memory? Well, but there are a lot of good memories, you know. Trying to think of, I think one of my fondest memories was the year we, when we passed the budget and, and I got that money in the budget for the valley and driving home uh, feeling pretty good about it. Do you have any future plans? Yeah, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade and I, I have a few clients that have uh, offered me some work to do for them and I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, kind of getting reacclimated to it. I'll be the general counsel for an organization back home uh, that, that I've already been doing a little bit of work for, but they want to expand my, my role with, with their organization. You may have already alluded to this a little bit, but what would you say your advice is for new members? Well, I think that the, um, be careful. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that you uh, keep your promises. And sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes, um, you know, I, I uh, can remember we had a real tough uh, gas tax fee increase vote for, for, for PennDOT. And I had told the district, I'm going to support it, I'm going to vote for it. Well, there were some people here that didn't think that was a very good idea. And I was put under a lot of pressure uh, to, to be against it. But I concluded that I... I was on the record and I was going to do it and, and it's not always easy to to keep your promises but uh, I think when you do that in the end people re respect what you're doing and um, even you know even uh, and, and, and you try to be helpful too you know that's that's a, the other thing and I think that sometimes we'll get calls from people we, you know you know and I'll tell them you know I'm not I don't have a, a magic wand here you know, to fix this problem. We'll look into it and I'll try to, you know, help guide you through this, this situation you're in. But, um, but I think people appreciate the good faith effort. My last question. How would you like your tenure as state representative to be remembered? Well, I'd like to be thought of as somebody who um, improved his district, made it a better place to live, who treated people fairly and set a, a good example, I guess, for the people to, fo to follow, the young, younger people. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative, thank I you. appreciated you taking the time to my, be with us today. My pleasure.